Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Albert Park. I'm the director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies, and I want to welcome you to uh, today's seminar. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Dini Shetchko, who's a postdoctoral fellow at our institute, the Institute for Emerging Market Studies at HKUST. Uh, Dini um, is also a research affiliate at the Fletcher School uh, Network for Sovereign Wealth and Global Capital at Tufts University. Uh, his research interests include uh, governance of state-owned enterprises and sovereign wealth funds, implications of state capitalism on international economic law. Um, his PhD is in uh, international economic law at Chinese University of Hong Kong. He did his undergraduate and master's work at uh, Bocconi University in Italy. And uh, during his PhD program was also a visiting researcher, both at Leeds University Business School in the UK and Melbourne uh, Law School in Australia. Uh, Dini is a member of a research team we have here at the HKSD Institute for Emerging Market Studies uh, that's been doing a number of research projects related to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which, as you know, is China's major initiative to engage countries around the world to build infrastructure and improve connectivity, um, to promote a shared vision of uh, prosperity. Um, the Institute um, has had kind of a quiet year in terms of activity because of the protests in November and the virus starting in January. Uh, so we've canceled and postponed any events, but we finally have decided that uh, we have to get back to our normal intellectual life. So we're now, this is the first uh, Institute seminar that we've held. Uh, and of course, this one will be online and we'll continue to uh, have online events uh, going forward um, and try to uh, get back to normal as, 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 as it will. Uh, so without any further ado, let me um, uh, let, uh, invite uh, Dini to start his presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you, Professor Park, and uh, hello, everyone. Everyone, thank you for making time to to join our our seminar on the Belt and Road Regulatory tra Transformation: Taming the Chinese uh, Investors' Risk. So, uh, as Professor Park said, that uh, this is the the first of a series of seminars that we plan to have, and. Uh, Today, we are go I'm going to discuss about uh, uh, the law that underpinned the, uh, the, Belt, and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, as we all, uh, as we all know now, uh, was, uh, is an initiative launched by the, by the Chinese uh, government uh, in uh, uh, around uh, five years ago. And, uh, uh, since then, uh, a, a number of investments have uh, have occurred, and uh, Chinese uh, investor uh, Chinese investments uh, in the uh, in Asia and uh, in Europe have uh, have have increased uh, dramatically, and uh, Sorry, can, can you see the, the slide? No, we cannot see the slides yet, Dean. Okay, uh, I guess now, yes. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, and uh, one thing I wanted to say before Dean gets started is that uh, if you have questions that you wanna ask Dean, uh, I'd like to encourage you to please use the chat function in Zoom and type your questions into chat and I will monitor them and uh, at the appropriate times uh, repeat them to the speaker. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, uh, since the launch, we have seen uh, different projects taking shape uh, in different countries. Uh, along uh, along the the Belt and Road Initiative, along the uh, on the Maritime Silk Road, and on uh, on the on the uh, on the la and uh, and land projects, and uh, 
eventually uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a, a multi-layered initiative that uh, has its uh, has as its core uh, infrastructure investments. But the uh, infrastructure investments are not uh, are not the only goal of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, uh, the, 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 the initiative itself uh, has uh, uh, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative itself as a, as a wording has been used uh, uh, also as a slogan, but it, it describes a, a, a number of economic objectives that the uh, Chinese government is pursuing, but also strategic objectives. So uh, on the side of economic objectives, there is a, a, an uh, increased transformation of, uh, of Chinese economy moving towards the services industry and, uh, and it also includes the, the creation of new uh, multimodal uh, transportation routes. It includes the uh, RMB internet internationalization, uh, the creation of tra trade facilitation mechanism between China and uh, the Belt and Road countries. On the other hand, uh, as strategic objectives of the Belt and Road, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, look at uh, the development of uh, Western China, uh, geopolitical objectives uh, in improving uh, relations with uh, Belt and Road uh, um, uh, countries, with countries that become part of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, technological leadership, which is also supported by another uh, Chinese uh, uh, policy initiative, which is uh, made in China 2025. Uh, the, the Belt and Road also uh, pursues uh, energy security objectives by uh, uh, incre uh, increasing the ability of China to uh, uh, get access to oil and gas from Central Asian countries, but also uh, through uh, the construction of pipelines that uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries and uh, avoid the Strait of uh, Malacca. So, uh, uh, as for now, uh, the, the main actors of the Belt and Road Initiative are Chinese state-controlled uh, entities, both uh, as, uh, in, in the implementing side of the projects, but uh, also in the financing side. So among them, it, it uh, deserves to be mentioned the Chinese Investment uh, Corporation, and, uh, which is the main Chinese uh, sovereign wealth fund with uh, uh, all, uh, with around one uh, trillion US dollars of uh, assets. Then uh, the Silk Road Fund, which is a, a specific uh, sovereign wealth fund that was uh, established in 2014 uh, in order to uh, pursue uh, investment, uh, in, uh, investments in the Belt and Road Initiative. And then there are Chinese uh, state-owned uh, policy uh, banks such as the Export Import Bank of China and the uh, China Development Bank and uh, also the major Chinese state-owned enterprises that uh, have uh, in, uh, that are implementing the, the projects, uh, the different projects of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, both in Southeast Asia that I have had the chance to visit some uh, some of the projects uh, like in uh, like uh, new uh, ports and uh, 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 connect and uh, railways, or uh, the they are also taking care about the construction of uh, uh, industrial parks, uh, and uh, and in Europe where where they are uh, making both uh, uh, investments and uh, share acquisitions. Uh, for example, uh, the Silk Road Fund uh, has acquired share of uh, in Italy uh, and the company that uh, manages uh, uh, Italian highways and uh, so on. The Chinese Investment Corporation, for example, has uh, also a uh, number of assets in logistics and uh, water management in, uh, in the UK. Other, uh, other investors uh, and financiers include uh, the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the new uh, development bank or the so-called uh, BRICS bank. Uh, both these institution, uh, these two institutions uh, were created uh, uh, together uh, with the initiative, even though the uh, president of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has uh, often explained that uh, the mandate of the bank is broader uh, than the Belt and Road Initiative. In addition to that, the Asian Development Bank, uh, the World Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Development has been uh, cooperating with Chinese uh, institutions to, fi to finance some of, the, of these projects. 
So there is also like a problem with the definition of, of projects, but uh, uh, um, this goes a little bit beyond the scope of, uh, of, of this uh, seminar. Then there are also other, uh, uh, other financing institutions, uh, such as uh, the development bank in recipient countries, uh, Singapore, uh, Singaporean uh, 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 banks uh, have, uh, have uh, the International Enterprise of Singapore has uh, signed an MOU with the uh, Chinese uh, banks that we already uh, saw. Uh, they, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong uh, Monetary Authority have established the Infrastructure Financial Facilitation Office. And uh, then there are also pr private and public banks that, uh, that issue uh, Silk Road bonds. And there are a number of private investors that are cooperating uh, with, uh, with Chinese investors uh, to implement uh, projects, uh, and, uh, there are a number of examples in uh, Southeast Asia, especially in uh, in the Philippines and in Thailand, where uh, rich uh, uh, rich local families are cooperating with uh, uh, major Chinese SOEs uh, to implement infrastructural projects. So, uh, due to as, as we can uh, as we can see also from uh, my my talk, uh, mostly. Um, uh, the most typical form of uh, investment are infrastructure investment or uh, or energy investments, which are uh, characterized uh, by uh, an extended geographical uh, 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 extension, a long time hor hor horizon for uh, for the investment, uh, which makes also uh, quite difficult uh, for the investment to become uh, profitable profitable in the short time, uh, and uh, the the need to make a, la a large upfront investment in order to implement the projects. So this uh, uh, creates particular risks for both the country where the investment is taking place and the, uh, the investors that are involved in the project. So there is uh, a natural business risk, but there are also a uh, risk of, uh, of corruption and of uh, financial sustainability of the project. And uh, some have related to this one, uh, to the idea of a debt, of a debt trap, uh, or debt trap diplomacy that uh, uh, some uh, critics to the Belt and Road uh, have, uh, um, have sustained this position. And in addition, there is, uh, due to the uh, wide number of countries involved in the Belt and Road, there is, uh, there is uh, significant regulatory and uh, political, political risk. Uh, so, in order to uh, to address this risk, uh, the countries need to uh, the, uh, the investors need to uh, rely on the uh, on the current investment regime uh, between uh, between uh, China uh, and uh, the Belt and uh, the Belt and Road countries. There is a, there is a, a problem because uh, the uh, the list of Belt and Road countries, or the countries that have that are part of the Belt and Road, have not been uh, identified in a in a very precise manner. So the the initiative itself is a, is an open initiative uh, led by the Chinese government. So uh, that have been also an uh, uh, an, in, an incremental uh, list of uh, countries, and uh, some say that now there are more than 100 countries that are part of the Belt and Road. Um, so the, the geographical delimitation of the Belt and Road is not very clear. In addition to that, the, uh, the other problem is that there is no specific treaty uh, that regulates the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so the, the, the investors rely on the existing regime. The existing investment regime between uh, China and the Belt and Road countries started to be uh, negotiated between uh, since 1982, when uh, Sweden signed the first BIT uh, with China, and then there have been uh, there has uh, been an increasing number of BITs, uh, making China uh, now one of the uh, countries that has the largest num number of bilateral investment treaty for the protection of uh, foreign investors. So. Um, Due to the time of their negotiation, Chinese uh, treaties uh, can be uh, grouped in uh, in uh, in four main uh, in four main groups. Uh, so there is there uh, uh, there is the first generation of bilateral investment treaties that uh, uh, and the second generation of bilateral investment treaties that China has uh, negotiated uh, on, uh, from 1982 uh, to uh, 19. 
87. So this treaty ha has uh, limited protection and for the foreign investors because it was a time that uh, China, uh, while it was opening up, there, uh, it wasn't uh, very much, uh, uh, it, it wasn't uh, very much willing uh, to uh, commit to uh, many protections to foreign investments. So uh, the only protection that was uh, granted in this, uh, in this first and second generation treaties uh, is those, uh, are those related to the amount of, com on, of compensation uh, in case of expropriation by the Chinese government. So uh, reflectively, uh, this, the Chinese investors that now are investing in the Belt and Road countries, they can enjoy the same type of protection that was at the time granted to foreign investors that was uh, investing in China. So this, uh, some of these treaties are, are listed in, in uh, in the slide. So there is a third generation of uh, bilateral investment treaties that uh, provide protection uh, for the foreign investors and uh, gives access to uh, the most important uh, investor uh, state arbitration venue, which is uh, ICSID and it's based in uh, Washington. Uh, and uh, the particularity of ICSID is that uh, the final de uh, decision of an appellate uh, of, a, of an ICSID uh, arbitral uh, uh, body is uh, is effective in the uh, in the in the countries as the final uh, as a decision of the final uh, of the final court of uh, of that country. So this uh, once the if the investors using the uh, this uh, venue uh, wins the case, it can then uh, enforce the decision without. Uh, um, major issues. So we can see here, uh, a third generation includes a bilateral investment treaties that China has signed with uh, ASEAN, uh, Uzbekistan and, uh, and other countries that are part of the Belt and Road. But uh, for example, in the, in the case of uh, EU, which is also uh, one, of the, um, it's the, one of the main destinations of the Belt and Road, uh, for at least the, uh, regarding Belt and Road going through land, uh, uh, most of these treaties are are old, and uh, so and some of the countries uh, which I have grouped in the BAT zero point zero uh, need, for these uh, investors need to rely on customer international law in order uh, to uh, protect their investments. And these countries in, uh, include countries where Chinese uh, companies are making major investments or are uh, primary uh, investors and include Afghanistan, Bhutan, Iraq, uh, Nepal, Palest Palestine, which are countries that uh, uh, have many problems and uh, are facing uh, serious, serious stability issues in some cases, and, uh, and have also very uh, poor uh, ranking on the World Bank ease of doing, uh, of doing business. So, uh, but uh, let's see, for example, now some of, uh, of, the, of the features of, of these uh, treaties that uh, indicate uh, wh why, the, why the current regime is, uh, is weak in order to provide protection for, uh, chi for Chinese investors. So, for example, uh, the China-Pakistan BIT, uh, we know that uh, Pakistan is one of the main destinations. One of the treaties applicable to the uh, uh, to, to Chinese investors is the bilateral investment treaty uh, signed uh, uh, in 1989. So this treaty that, uh, has a very uh, uh, limited protection for Chinese state-owned enterprises. Uh, first of all, in relation to the definition of investor. So in this case, uh, uh, we are I'm referring to. Uh, the idea of uh, state-owned enterprise and uh, sovereign wealth funds in the, in the treaty, the language uh, refers only to economic ent entities established in accordance uh, with the laws of uh, People's Republic of China and having a seat in its territory. So uh, this uh, might uh, become problematic in case of, uh, of state-owned enterprise and sovereign, uh, sovereign in and other sovereign investors. Uh, because of the close link with the Chinese government. And uh, other problem relates to uh, the type of uh, protection they have. So the, uh, the, the protections are granted only in case of uh, expropriations, uh, as, I, 
as I also mentioned a few minutes ago. But this uh, language has, has improved through the year, but also in the case of Greece, for example, the, uh, the t terminology used is, uh, is similar. So uh, we, we know, for example, in Greece, there are ma major Chinese investments now, and one is in the port of, uh, in the port of Pireo. And he also here, uh, it's only uh, refers to uh, economic entities. And uh, also, the, uh, the, the foreign investor can only seek protection uh, in case of expropriation, not uh, for other uh, uh, for other uh, negative treatments from the state, uh, from the host state that can affect its its right to uh, enjoy from uh, to enjoy the, the benefits of its investment. So uh, as uh, as we can see now in the in the third generation, the China Uzbekistan. Uh, it is clear that the state-owned enterprises can, can enjoy uh, can enjoy uh, pro, uh, protection, and and they, are, and they are identified clearly as as investors. So uh, we can see from the language of the of the Article 1.2 of the China Uzbekistan uh, that uh, the time enterprise uh, means any entities, and we can go a bit down that. Uh, uh, irrespective of whether or not uh, op they operate for profit or they are owned or controlled by a private or uh, a person or a government. So we can, uh, in, in, the, in the case of the Chinese investments in, the, in Uzbekistan, it is clear that uh, these investors can enjoy the, the protections offered by, yeah. uh, by, the, by the bilateral investment treaty. And they can also access. Uh, they can also access exit and uh, for any type of uh, of breach of the, of the treaty. So some of the most typical uh, protection are uh, that of national treatment, and uh, we can see that modern uh, modern treaties, third generation treaties, they ensure uh, protection for the breach of national treatment by. Uh, by the host state. So uh, national treatment means that uh, the Chinese investors need to be uh, treated in the same way uh, as the uh, domestic investor. And uh, we can see that the, the first and second generation uh, treaties do not have uh, su uh, such a type of uh, clause, but the new, the new modern treaties, they ensure that uh, Chinese uh, investors are treated in the same way in like circumstances to uh, the uh, uh, the investors of the host country, and uh, the same uh, dynamic operates in the case of fair and equitable treatment. So fair, fair and equi equitable treatment is another typical clause of uh, of uh, bilateral investment treaties, which uh, make sure that uh, the foreign investors is uh, treated fairly uh, without. Uh, uh, being discriminated or uh, without uh, uh, without the domestic uh, administration taking uh, arbitrary measures against the foreign investors. So, uh, as we can see uh, from uh, the treaty listed on this slide, there has been an evolution of uh, of the clause, which uh, allows for a better for a better and clear protection of uh, Chinese investors nowadays in uh, those countries that have signed with China. Uh, the so-called uh, third generation uh, bilateral investment treaties. And uh, this uh, is not only is, is not a theoretical exercise. Uh, so the, the problems related to the language uh, of the treaties have become evident uh, in, the, in the cases that uh, Chinese investors have brought in front of, uh, of investment tri uh, tribunals and uh, uh, the outcome um, of the cases uh, has not uh, uh, the, the the procedure of the cases have uh, ad addressed uh, uh, some of the issues. So the the, the decision uh, have uh, determined that the state-owned uh, investors, for example, in the case of uh, uh, BUCG, uh, BUCG versus Yemen, which is uh, which was a case that uh, a Chinese construction company that uh, was uh, implementing a project for the construction of uh, the international airport of uh, 
uh, Sana in Yemen uh, brought against the Yemeni government. Uh, the tribunal in that case determined uh, that uh, that BUCG, uh, even though state owned, it was operating as a as a commercial uh, as a commercial investor, so it was allowed to enjoy the the protections of the treaty. Other issues relate also to the uh, uh, to the connection between the old and the existing uh, the old existing treaty and the new treaty, and th this issue became evident in the Pingan versus Belgium case. So the the tribunal uh, in that case uh, clarified the relationship between. Uh, these uh, two treaties. So, as we can see, uh, it, it is uh, rather cumbersome for Chinese investors because they, they need to, uh, if, if they bring a case, they need to focus on very, on many proce proce procedural issues and uh, this uh, can uh, affect, uh, might affect the outcome of, uh, of the case. So, uh, as a, and uh, as a preliminary conclusion, we can say that uh, the existing investment regime uh, for uh, Chinese investments, uh, investors need to be uh, upgraded in order to allow them to, to, uh, and to make sure that they can enjoy uh, better treaty protections. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, the investors can uh, uh, take action in order to mitigate their risk and uh, draft investment contracts and uh, make sure that the dispute settlement clause of this investment contract refer to, uh, uh, to uh, reliable in, uh, international courts or uh, arbitration venues, such as, for example, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, the CETAC, uh, and, or the ICC. Uh, all these uh, three institutions, they are uh, promoting themselves uh, as institutions uh, able to deal with the Belt and Road uh, uh, related disputes, but uh, more recently, in 2018, uh, Chinese government uh, created a, uh, a specific uh, Chinese International Commercial Court, uh, which uh, can deal with uh, uh, Belt and Road uh, related uh, commercial disputes. And another uh, me method that uh, investors uh, investing in the Belt and Road Initiative is the use of mediation. And uh, since, uh, since August uh, 2019, uh, there is the so-called uh, Singaporean conven uh, Convention that allows uh, for a more uh, institutionalized mediation process. In addition, they, uh, the, for the, Ch the Chinese investors can, uh, can uh, use investment guarantees uh, uh, given by uh, Chinese uh, agencies such as uh, Sinosure or the international agencies such as uh, MIGA. So, uh, as we can see, the, the, ex the current uh, regulatory uh, framework is uh, rather fragmented and uh, the, does not provide the best uh, protection for uh, for the for the investors that are engaging in the initiative. In fact, uh, as uh, it was recognized in the vision and actions uh, um, paper that was issued by the uh, Chinese uh, by the Chinese Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, Chinese Ministry of uh, uh, Commerce, and uh, the NDRC with the approval of the state councils. Uh, the, one of the objectives of the of the Belt and Road is to uh, speed up investment facilitation among countries and eliminate the barriers and push forward for the negotiation uh, of uh, bilateral investment protection agreements and double taxation uh, avo uh, avoidance agreements to protect the lawful rights of uh, and interest of the investors. So. Um, there has been uh, since then uh, a move in that in that direction that we will see soon. But there has been also a, a reaction. So the, the increasing Chinese investments in uh, in assets that are uh, often deemed uh, as uh, strategic uh, by the uh, by the host countries have uh, triggered uh, had triggered uh, responses in the host uh, in the host states. Uh, due to the to, to the national security risk related to some of these investments, uh, and uh, has uh, pushed the European Union uh, to to 
to clarify its, its position towards China. So the European Union in tradition has been very open towards foreign investment and uh, differently from, uh, from the United States of, uh, of America uh, has not had a, 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 a mechanism that scrutinized uh, foreign investment such as uh, is the case of CFIUS uh, in, in the United States. So uh, while the, uh, the, uh, the EU was uh, drafting its own investment screening mechanisms, uh, it also issue uh, a strategic uh, outlook uh, for uh, in relation to EU China uh, relations so in this uh, in this strategic outlook China was uh, identified as a, as a systemic rival which was promoting alternative uh, models of gar of governance so uh, this also uh, uh, was uh, driven by the political uh, position of certain European leaders which uh, uh, were feeling concerned by an increasing inv uh, Chinese investments in, uh, in strategic European assets such as, such, such, uh, such as was the case of the Chinese investments in the port of Pireo which, uh, uh, which caused a, a, even a declaration from uh, from the European, uh, from uh, Mr. Juncker at the time, uh, who, um, who said that uh, the, uh, the Europeans uh, shouldn't be naive towards, uh, towards trade. And there's also uh, the need for a greater reciprocity in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the case of uh, investments with uh, China. So, uh, as, a, as of a, uh, as to follow to uh, these uh, dynamics, uh, the Belt and Road uh, has, uh, is triggering uh, a regulatory transformation. And this regu uh, tr uh, regulatory transformation is uh, taking uh, shape uh, in, th in three uh, dimensions. The soft law dimension, which seems to be so far the main uh, tool uh, for uh, for the Belt and Road uh, Initiative re uh, related agreements. So most of the countries that are now uh, part to the Belt and Road have signed a memorandum of understanding with the Chinese uh, government. And uh, here I refer to uh, the case of uh, Italy, which is one of the only uh, G7 country that has signed a memorandum of understanding with, uh, with the Chinese government. Uh, and this happened last year, uh, last year in March. So what is uh, important about memorandum of understanding and, and we can see here uh, from the section of the test of the memorandum that I have highlighted, uh, the memorandum of understanding are not international treaties. So they do not create uh, obligations under international law. So uh, even though from the political dimension, it, it, uh, the memorandum of understanding is an important uh, tool that indicates uh, that the relationship between two countries is very good and there is a, a serious engagement uh, from uh, both countries to, uh, in relation to the, Bay, uh, the, to the Belt and Road. As you can see from the provision, uh, the memorandum uh, does not create legal and financial commitments for the parties. So uh, no, uh, neither China can uh, oblige Italy uh, to, uh, to make uh, to certain concessions if these uh, concessions are in, uh, are in violation of uh, Italian interest or in violation of uh, Italian and European interest because Italy is part of the European Union. So the Europe, uh, what has been agreed between, uh, uh, at the European Union level need to be considered uh, by Italy. Oh, and other uh, tra uh, the regulatory transformation is taking uh, place at the hard law uh, level. So, uh, so the drafting of new treaties, and uh, we can uh, see that there's some uh, Chinese uh, and the international authors have referred to a Chinese uh, investment mo uh, 
Chinese bilateral investment treaty model 4.0, uh, which are treaties that grant even gra greater protection to Chinese investment, but also uh, consider uh, aspects related to the protection of environment. So in this case, we can uh, refer to, uh, to new treaties uh, negotiated at the bilateral level, such as, for example, China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement negotiated in 2010, and the Hong Kong uh, ASEAN Free uh, Trade Agreement, uh, uh, which was signed uh, in the past years. Um, I think there is not uh, a possibility for uh, for a bilateral uh, for a multilateral investment a treaty for the uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative, but uh, some uh, major treaties um, uh, are some the negotiation for some uh, major uh, plurilateral uh, agreements are ongoing. So uh, there is the original comprehensive economic partnership uh, which was initiated by the ASEAN, including uh, six other countries. Uh, including China. And uh, this treaty has also become known as a, as a Chinese treaty. While this is not true because the negotiations were initiated by uh, by ASEAN, uh, by ASEAN, and then there is the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on uh, on investment, and uh, the the negotiation for this uh, for this um, plurilateral investment agreement started in 2013, and they are still ongoing. And uh, now we are at a standstill, also due to the uh, to the situation related to to the virus. The other hand, at the uh, at the domestic level, uh, most states are, are are concerned with uh, Chinese investment, so they they have decided to to strengthen uh, their uh, uh, the, the, to strengthen the protection of uh, sectors that are deemed of uh, of, of strategic importance and uh, are related to uh, national security, and this has. Uh, uh, pushed countries such as uh, Germany, France, and Italy to modify in the recent years uh, their, uh, their uh, domestic uh, legislation in relation to the protection of uh, foreign investments. And some of these, uh, as like, uh, some, uh, even though this, uh, the, uh, the language of these agreements does not clearly refer, refer to China, some of these changes are related to a, an increase of Chinese uh, of flows of Chinese investments into into European market, and as I was referring earlier uh, to the to the European Union at the European Union level, for the first time uh, uh, last year, uh, the European Parliament and the Commission issued the regulation uh, 2019 uh, 452 that established a European framework uh, for the screening of uh, foreign direct investment in the European Union. So even though the, also in the European case uh, at the original level, uh, the, the language of the regulation does not refer specifically to Chinese investments, but it refers uh, broadly to investments in uh, strategic sectors. Uh, what triggered this uh, change of uh, uh, position of the European Union was the increase of Chinese investment. So as, as we can see, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, creates many opportunities, but also many risks for Chinese uh, investors, uh, both in, uh, in Europe and in other Belt and Road countries. But this has also generated uh, a, a, negative, uh, an, a negative reception of some of these investments due to the potential risk that uh, these investors can cause in the country uh, wh where they are making the investments. So, for example, uh, in the case of the Philippines, uh, one of the major Chinese investments has been in uh, the electrical grid. And, uh, and uh, even though the investments have been uh, rather successful and has been there, uh, the Ch uh, Chinese State Grid Corporation has been investing in the Philippines since 2007 to get, uh, together with the uh, uh, local partners, uh, there, there is increasing debate of the potential risk that, uh, uh, that the, the foreign control of, uh, of a Chinese uh, company on, uh, on a strategic asset such as uh, electric, uh, electrical grid can have on the, uh, on the country. So, uh, yeah, so these are the 
the three types of, uh, of transformation that uh, have uh, have been uh, uh, ongoing uh, have been going on, on in the countries uh, due to the to the Belt and Road Initiative. So I, I think I can give uh, the floor to, to Professor Park now. Great, thanks, Dean. Let me um, start by asking you a question myself. Um, so I, I guess one question I had is, what is the implications for Hong Kong? Uh, we know Hong Kong's trying to make itself a, dis a dispute resolution center. It seems like, as you described it, some of the international investment treaties allow for arbitration options. I don't know uh, to what extent the willingness and ability of either the Chinese parties or the other parties to disputes uh, can come to Hong Kong and uh, resolve those disputes. And if that depends on the kind of treaty there is, or if it's even a popular option at all for typically for Belt and Road investment. So I was wondering if you could say a few words about that. Okay, so I, I think there, I, I will divide the answer into two parts. One in relation to uh, Hong Kong as a dispute settlement uh, center, and the other one in relation to the Hong, to Hong Kong, uh, to, the pro uh, to the protection of investors that are based in Hong Kong. So uh, with respect to, uh, to Hong Kong as a dispute settlement center, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center has been promoting uh, itself as a as a venue as a venue for uh, investors for both uh, Hong Kong investors and Chinese investors that invest uh, through Hong Kong in other Belt and Road countries uh, to implement Belt and Road uh, projects. So uh, uh, Hong Kong has a very uh, good uh, environment for uh, especially international commercial arbitration uh, due to the uh, to the domestic uh, legislation and the support of the domestic courts for uh, international arbitration. So this uh, would allow uh, the fo uh, both Chinese and foreign investors to, to use uh, the Hong Kong Arbitration Center as a, as a venue for, uh, for the solution of, of disputes. On, on the other hand, with respect to the Hong Kong investors that are investing in the other country, uh, they can uh, now uh, enjoy additional protection because Hong Kong is is engaging uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, is engaging in the negotiation of uh, of new treaties. So uh, in order to expand its uh, its uh, set of bilateral investment treaties with uh, countries that are part of the Belt and Road, it's, and as I refer in one of the slides, uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, the new uh, signed treaty between Hong Kong and ASEAN, which uh, provides a very uh, very good protection to uh, Hong Kong investors that uh, are investing in the ASEAN countries. And similarly, uh, these, in, uh, these protections are also applicable to uh, ASEAN investors investing in Hong Kong. Great. So we have a question from Kevin Lee. Uh, he's asking about the prospects of this China International Commercial Court, which you said has been developed in particular, I'm curious whether if it's an international investment agreement, do non-Chinese companies really feel comfortable settling their disputes in a Chinese court if the dispute is with like a Chinese state enterprise? But more generally, what are the prospects? What is the role do you think this new, new commercial court will play? Well, uh, it is my understanding that uh, so far, uh, the, the, the use of this course ha has been quite limited. I am only aware of, uh, of two cases decided by this courts, and uh, even though the, the parties are uh, uh, from, uh, from Belt and Road countries, so one case that I recall now is uh, it, it involves a, a Chinese, uh, sorry, a Thai, a Thai uh, company, uh, but I'm not sure uh, for, uh, for the prospects if they will become uh, main venues for the solution of these uh, disputes or if the investors will prefer to rely on existing and uh, institutions who has, uh, that have uh, been operating efficiently and in a credible manner. So it will be, it will be a challenge uh, both for, the, for the institutions to become, uh, to, to, to be able to attract 
uh, the investors to use these institutions as uh, as venues for the solution of disputes. Okay, great. We have another question from Derek King, um, who is interested to know what you think about the role of Sinusure in promoting Belt and Road investments. Do you know Sinusure? It's the uh, China Export and Credit Insurance Corporation. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I refer to this as a, as a mitigation uh, mechanism for, for the investments, but at, uh, it should be kept in mind that uh, this, uh, this insurance, uh, insurances are not uh, a substitute for uh, the rights uh, for the investors' ability to, uh, to, to claim their rights. So uh, they, they cannot uh, be seen as a substitute of, of the lack of, uh, of dispute settlement uh, mechanism with, uh, and uh, treaty protection with the state where, uh, where the investor is investing. So, but just like a measure of last resort, because uh, in a, uh, that would also uh, increase, uh, uh, increase the, the cost of the investment and it will become also problematic for, for the institution itself that is providing uh, this, uh, this protection to, uh, to the investors. If, uh, if, the, if Sinusure itself is it's required to provide large disbursement in case of, a fa of a failure of the investment. Okay. I have another question, which is about how much the terms of these investment treaties really affects the decisions by Chinese enterprises to invest in a specific country. In other words, I understand the idea that it's important, it's better for Chinese firms to have better protections or fairer protections, but when they're actually making a decision to, let's say, build a factory in the Philippines or Indonesia or a mine in Africa, do they really pay attention to the terms of these treaties and think about what would happen in a dispute? Or because many of them are state owned, do they really try to uh, more rely on a good government to government relationship to kind of address unknown disputes that might occur in the future? Or do they really think that the courts are the key way and so it affects their decision whether to invest in a particular country? Well, this is a, this is a very good question that, uh, that goes back uh, also to a, a major discussion. Uh, in international investment law and uh, that regards the ability of uh, international investment uh, treaties to attract uh, more investment so to, to to shape the investor decision to to decide on uh, to decide if to invest in one country or another based on the uh, on the investment network so i'm i'm not sure about the decision making me mechanism uh, that uh, pushes uh, Chinese SOEs to, to invest uh, in uh, one project or another, even though uh, we are quite aware of, uh, of the support of uh, SASAC for Belt and Road investments. But uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if uh, these assessments are, are made or uh, based on the bilateral investment treaty. Because uh, one thing that we should keep in mind is that uh, uh, major uh, companies they also uh, rely on investment contracts which can be costly for uh, uh, smaller or medium sized enterprises but uh, the, the cost of uh, hiring very good lawyers then then negotiate specific uh, international contracts with uh, uh, with the country uh, can be done by uh, by major soes and uh, in the case of these contracts they can uh, opt for uh, different uh, dispute settlement institutions uh, in lack of the bilateral investment treaty. I see. Okay, um, I think we're out of questions. So uh, if anybody in the audience has a question, uh, please type it into the chat box. We'll maybe wait uh, a moment. So if not, why don't we uh, close the seminar and thank uh, Dini for 
a uh, very interesting presentation, a very uh, thought provoking, and I think it gives us some insights into the legal frameworks for investment treaties and how how they've evolved and how they're influencing uh, China's Belt and Road investments. So, uh, oh, wait a second. I got one here question. Um, are there any protections for financial investments, like from funds and whatnot? in the BRA compared to direct investments in infrastructure. In infrastructure, sorry. Um, so uh, to go back to the doctrinal division of the treaties, uh, some of the new treaties have protection for transfer of funds, so which uh, enable the companies that are making these investments to, to, uh, to have the, the right to transfer their they are France from, from the country of origin to the other country, but this is all, uh, this uh, needs to, to be studied on the specific language of every treaty. I see, so the normal protections are mainly for the actual investments, not yeah. the financing so much. Uh, so like the, for, for the financing, the, uh, there are, uh, transfer of funds clauses in the treaty, but uh, I uh, this study does not include the analysis of the of the provision, so I, I cannot uh, make clear references. And and is there ever cases where the Chinese enterprises or the Chinese government, if they're doing big projects in a Belt and Road country, where they demand that some treaty terms be improved or changed because they're worried about the risk or is that kind of not really part of the direct negotiations over Belt and Road projects? Well, uh, in relation to the Belt and Road countries, China has, uh, has started negotiation with, uh, with some of the, of the countries which are part of the Belt and, the Belt and Road. So, uh, but uh, I'm not aware of the of a clear connection between uh, between the uh, a single project and the need to to modify the treaty. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. So I'd I'd like to close the seminar, and uh, for all of the participants, thank you for uh, joining today's event. Uh, we'll put you on our mailing list and let you know about future. Uh, online or face-to-face -face events uh, that will be held by the Institute for Emerging Market Studies. So thank you very much, Dini. Thank you. Thank you for attending the event. Bye-bye. Okay.